Good evening. Welcome to the Bible study of the New Beginning Church from our remote location. It is July 3rd. Therefore, we're having Bible study from this remote location. Everybody's enjoying their family outings. But I'm glad that you paused for a moment just to have Bible study on this Wednesday night. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We honor your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you again for the privilege of studying your word. We ask you to bless us today, Father God, that your word will be clear, your word will be relevant, your word will be sure, that we will understand your word, Father God, in such a way that it will bless our lives. We ask you to bless us as we go tonight through your word. Bless us as we go through these principles, Father God, that your principles will become real to us. Lord, we thank you for the victory. Thank you for blessing us and all that you have accomplished to us. Bless us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. We ended our Bible study on last week speaking about the difference between a God-centered life and a human-centered life, a man-centered life. So tonight we'll close out on page 33 and 34. We will close out the Experiencing God book, uh, day one from unit two. So as we look at this tonight, we're looking at God's plan and not our plan. Page 33, the, the topic is God's plan and not our plan. The scripture that we will be looking at is found in John 12. The overall arching scripture is John 12, verses 23 through 25. John 12, 23 through 25 talks about a grain of wheat. We also talked about the fact that the, we have to put deny ourselves, put ourselves away, put ourselves aside, put our desires aside. As we put our desires aside, then we're working with God and watching where God is at work. As we're watching where God is at work, we realize that God is doing some things all around us. The key theme throughout the Experience in God book is that God is at work all around us. And as he's at work all around us, we need to look for an opportunity, a chance, a place by which we can join God where he's at work. And since God is already at work around us, we don't have to go look uh, for somebody who's working. We just have to watch what God is at work, watch what God is doing while he's at work and join God where he's at work. Now, this particular lesson tonight will challenge us because we've been taught to make plans. And yes, we ought to make plans. We should make plans on a regular basis. But when it comes to looking at life from God's perspective, we need to understand that God is at work and we have to join him. As we make plans, we need to look at God's purpose first. The topic is God's purpose not our plans. To live a God-centered life, you must be focused on God's purposes. We must be focused on God's purposes and not our plans. As we focus on God's purposes, we will quickly obey God, quickly uh, do what God is calling us to do. But we have to make sure that we are living a God-centered life. God centers life is, is given to us based on God's purpose. We must seek to view every situation from God's perspective. As we find ourselves in many situations, we must learn to view them from God's perspective. When we view them from God's perspective rather than our perspective, we're able to let go the human outlooks in life. He says, Henry Bakery says, when God starts to do something in the world, he, may, he takes the initiative to reveal his will to people. When God is doing something, when God begins to do things in this world, he makes sure, who? God makes sure that he reveals his will to his people. God is looking to reveal his will to us. God is looking 
to reveal his, his purposes to us. And when God is doing something, and I've already said, God is always at work. God is always doing something. So when God starts something, when God is doing something in the entire world, when God is doing something, he takes the initiative. God makes sure that he reveals himself to his people. He reveals his will to his people. God is able to reveal his will to us even while we are making our plans. Therefore, we must focus on the plans of God. We must focus on the will of God and not on our plans. We must focus on the purposes of God and not our plans. <clears throat> Throughout history, this has been shown to be true. Throughout history, God in his wisdom, God has infinite wisdom. Throughout history, God in his infinite wisdom has chosen to involve his people in accomplishing his purpose. God will always call his people to accomplish his purposes. It has been clear throughout all of history. Let's look at our scripture. Our scripture is John 12, 23 through 25, and I summarize here as found on page 33. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground, uh, falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. In other words, if this grain of wheat, if this one grain of wheat does not fall into the ground, or fall to the ground rather, and as it fall, after it falls to the ground, it dies, then this grain of wheat, if it does not fall, if it does not meet the ground, if it does not uh, die, then it will remain to itself. It's just one grain of wheat, and it will not be productive. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. It will not be productive as long as it is living. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. When a grain of wheat falls to the ground, when a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, then it is able to produce much fruit. The one who loves his life will lose it. One who loves his life will lose his or her life for God's sake. And the one who hates his life in the world will keep it for eternal life. You have to learn to lose what you have in order to gain what God has to offer. He goes on to say that the one who hates his life in this world, this worldly life has a lot of stuff to offer. But the fact of the matter is we must hate this worldly life. And when we hate this worldly life, then we will keep or we will gain eternal life. So when a grain of wheat falls into the ground, when a grain of wheat is covered by the ground, it is covered, it dies. And as it dies, as that grain of wheat dies, then it can produce much fruit. We must die to ourselves daily. The apostle Paul puts it like this. He says, I die to myself daily. Therefore, as I die to myself daily, I am able to win others to Christ. But we can't do it our way. When God starts something and he starts to do something in this world in which we live, he takes the initiative to reveal what he is doing to mankind, those who love him, those who are his people, in accomplishing his purpose. He does it by accomplishing his purposes. He, he accomplishes his purpose by using those which he is able to reveal things to. 
and he is able to reveal things to those who are born again, those who are saved, those are his people. The author in, on page 33 references several passages of scripture, four of them to be exact. Genesis 6, 5 through 14. Genesis 6, 5 through 14. What was God about to do when Noah built the ark? Genesis 6, 5 through 14. What was Noah about to do when he built the ark? Then he asked the question, what was God about to do to Solomon and Gomorrah, Gomorrah when he came to Abraham in Genesis chapter 18 and Genesis chapter 19? Genesis chapter 18 and Genesis chapter 19. The question is, what was God about to do to Solomon and Gomorrah when he came to Abraham? The next question, what was God about to do when he came to Gideon, Gideon. What was God about to do when he came to Gideon? And that scripture is John chapter, I mean, Judges, Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. The question is, what was God about to do when he came to Gideon? Next question. What was God about to do when he came to Saul? later known as Paul, the great writer in the New Testament on the road to Damascus. This is found in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 16. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 16. God was up to something when he came to Saul on the Damascus road in Acts chapter 9. Why is it that it's more important to know God is planning to do something than it is for us to to focus on our plans. Why is it more important for God, for us to know what God is planning rather than us to focus on our plans? On page 34 of the Experiencing God book, Henry Blackaby and others talk about the fact that God was about to destroy the whole world with a devastating flood when he approached Noah. Here God is, he has a plan. His plan is to do something. He approaches a person who loves him, Noah, and he says that, Noah, I'm about to destroy this entire world, and I'm going to do it by way of a devastating flood. So, Noah, I need you to accomplish something. Noah, I need you to build an ark. And we know the rest is history in the fact that Noah built an ark. He took his family onto the ark and he took uh, two items on two two different um, genders, male and female of every species, every bird, every, every animal that was on the earth, he took them onto the boat. He took them onto the ark. He made sure that he followed where God was working and he reacted for where God was doing while God was at work. Devastating flood came, Noah and his family were saved, all of the animals were saved, one female of each animal, one male of each animal on the ark. God included Noah in what he was about to do. When God prepared to destroy Solomon and Gomorrah, he went to Abraham. He told Abraham, and when he told Abraham what he was about to do, then God and Abraham started this negotiation process. Will you, will you spare Solomon and Gomorrah if you found 50 righteous people there? In other words, Solomon and Gomorrah was so messed up until there were very limited number or none <laughs> Uh, righteous people in Solomon and Gomorrah. So God decided, I am going to destroy it. Before he destroyed it, he went to Abraham. Abraham began to ask the question, if there are 50 people there, will you spare it? If there are 40 people there, will you, despair, will you spare it? If there are 10 people there, will you spare it? If there's one righteous person in Solomon and Gomorrah, will you spare it? God went to Abraham. God had let Abraham know that
that I'm about to do some things. Abraham joined God where God was at work. And when he joined God where God was at work, then he went on and destroyed Solomon and Gomorrah because there was not one righteous there. Abraham was trying to save the city and the cities, and he was trying to save his family. God initiated a relationship, a conversation with Abraham. Whenever God is doing something, he's going to involve some human being to make sure that that human being can join him where he is at work. So he involved Abraham. God also came to Gideon. And when he came to Gideon, he came to Gideon as he was about to defeat uh, the opposition of the Gentiles. He was about to defeat the Gentile opposition that oppressed, that oppressed the Israelites. And he chose Gideon. And you know the story. The fact is that Gideon had several people, uh, some 22,000 people. And he, God, uh, told him that he had too many. He cut them down to 300 righteous men, 300 men who would fight for him. And they took over and they won the battle. God was about to do something. God approached Gideon and said, whatever you do, make sure you make sure that the people can see me at work. And the only way that they can see me at work is the fact that they know that they didn't do it on their own. So he cut the leadership down and he cut the fighting men down to 300 men and they won the battle and they had to admit that God did it and no man was victorious without God. Without a doubt, the important factor in each of these situations was the, was the fact that God was about to do what God does best. And as God talked to Noah, as God talked to Abraham, as God talked to Gideon, as God talked to Saul, God was up to something. They had to join God where God was at work. God prepared their heart. He prepared them to make some things happen because he is God. When you have a God-centered life, it doesn't always make sense to you. When you have a God-centered life, you deny yourself, you move to what God would have you to do, and God is able to, to use you. Let's use uh, Noah, for example. The author talks about the fact that what his plans was, was to build an ark, but he was going by God's plan. They would not make such sense. It was, it was in light of the coming destruction. Noah was not calling God in to help him accomplish what he was dreaming to do for God. This is a devastating statement to me. <laughs> Noah was not calling God. <clears throat> he was not calling on God in to come help him accomplish what he was dreaming to do for God. And we ought to pray, we ought to plan, we ought to look to do some things for God. But the Bible teaches, and Henry Blackaby says it over and over again through his Experience in God book, Noah was not calling God in to help Noah accomplish the things of God. He, he had dreamed, he had he planned, but he was not calling God in to do things for God. God never asked people to dream up something to do for him. Wow. Our plans are geared around what we dream. Our plans are geared around what we can do for God. And we ought to look for plans and ways to do some things for God. This is a challenging statement in the fact that that we are taught in the Christian walk that we ought to pray and ask God. And we ought to pray and ask God. But we ought to also join God where God is at work. God will place us in certain situations. He place us in circumstances that he is at work in. And we ought to join him right there. So neither of these characters, 
dreamt up. They did not dream up things to do and ask God to come join them. So our prayer should be, God, show us where you are at work and bless us to join you where you are at work. God, it is a privilege to join you where you are working. We do not sit down and brainstorm what we want to do for God and then call God in to help us to accomplish our plans. Wow, for years. I mean, this has been the way where we sit down and we brainstorm, we get opinions and we, we negotiate one with the other and find out what God is looking to do. And then we want to make sure that we lay it out. We have a plan. We have a timeline. Timeline. But Henry Blackaby says here that we don't do those, take that process on. What he says is that we look for where God is. The pattern in scripture is that we submit ourselves to God. God, your will. God, your way. God, do what you do, and I'm coming to join you where you're already at work. So he puts us in circumstances, situations, conditions where he's already working, and then we join God where he's at work. Then we wait until God shows us what God is about to do. We wait and see, and we listen we watch what God is doing and where, where God is showing us where he's at work and he shows us what he's about to do. Or we watch to see what God is already, what God is already doing around us. Then we join in with him. It's a challenging, challenging lesson in the fact that we are always taught to be proactive and not reactive. But when it comes to God, it's not a matter of being reactive. We're just joining God where God is already at work. The summary statements for this particular day, day one, as we close out day one of unit two, to know and do God's will, I must deny myself and return to a God-centered life. To know and do God's will, I have to deny myself and return to a God-centered life. When we have a God-centered life, we focus on where God is. We focus on who God is. We focus on what God plans to do. We join God, join God where he's already at work. And when we do that, then we have what is known as a God-centered life and not a human-centered life. Point number two. We must focus our lives on God's purposes and not on our own plans. As we live this God-centered life, we must focus our purposes. We must focus our life on God's purposes. We must focus our attention on God's purposes and not on our plans. Point number three. We must seek to see from God's perspective rather than from our own distorted human outlook. Our outlook on life is distorted. Our human outlook is a look where we see, Paul says, we see through a glass darkly. It's a dim glass. We see through a glass darkly. We don't see it all. One thing that I always reflect on is that a football game you always have somebody in the skybox. There's a person in the skybox. There's a coordinator in the skybox, and he can see the whole field, whereas the coach on the field and the player on the field cannot see everything at one time. And when the coach on the field sees what's going on from his limited perspective, then he makes a call based on what he sees and not always does that play is is that play successful because he doesn't see the whole field. But the coordinator, the person, the coach in the skybox that sits up high, looks at what's down low. That person sees it all, and he radios back down to the coach on the field and say they blissing, they are blissing, and the coach on the field makes the adjustment. The players make that adjustment. 
What I'm saying to you today is that God is high and he sees everything. And because God sees everything, he's able to make a call that we cannot see. We must seek to see from God's perspective. God has a perspective that we will never have unless we live a God-centered life. Jesus says in John 15, <clears throat> abide in me and I will abide in you. And as you abide in me and I abide with you, you will make much fruit. You will be fruitful. A lot of people are living, but they're not fruitful. A lot of people are leafy, but they're not fruitful. Uh, the psalmist says in Psalms number one that he gives forth much fruit because he walks in God. He lives in God. He associates with the people of God. Then you will bear much fruit. We bear fruit because we're looking at it from a God perspective and not a human perspective. The next point. We must wait until God shows us what he is about to do through us. We must continue to wait on God. It, in this life that is fast paced, we don't like to wait. And I understand waiting is hard. But when we wait on God, Isaiah says we will mount up with wings as eagles. We will run and not be wearied. We should, should walk and not faint. Isaiah says in Isaiah 40 that even the young men will pass out. But those of us who wait on the Lord will renew our strength. We will mount up with wings like eagles. We shall run and not get weary when we wait on God. So we must wait until God shows us what he's about to do through us. God is about to do some great things through us, but we have to be patient enough to wait on him. My final point I will watch. We must watch to see what God is doing around us and join him where he's at work. We must watch to see where God is at work, where God is working all around us, what God is doing all around us, and join God where he's at work. Henry Black will be on page 34 of the book, Experiencing God. He tells the story of... Um, of a young lady who's locked up in prison. She's guilty. Carla Faye Tucker. Carla Faye Tucker was a prisoner and she was not living a God-centered life. God-centered living always affects other people. As we live God-centered lives, it will always affect other people. Being certain God is always at work around us will affect our relationships with others. If we are certain that God is working around us, it would affect people in our relationships. This story about uh, Carla Faye Tucker, when Carla Faye Tucker was on death row, in the Gainesville Women's Prison in Texas, she became a Christian. The story about Carla Faye Tucker is the fact that she killed a man and a woman along with her accomplice. They killed a man and a woman, broke into the apartment, killed them with a pick, pickaxe. Killed them for no apparent reason. They hadn't done anything to her, hadn't done anything to her, the guy that was with her. But they went into the apartment and they killed two people with a pickaxe. But while she was locked up in the prison, she was witnessed to by faithful Christians. And they walked her through their experience in life, experiencing God uh, workbook. Her life was so transformed that she became began to teach other inmates on death row about Jesus. See, it doesn't, it doesn't matter once you have this God-centered life, how you got there. It doesn't matter how bad you've been when you turn your life over to Christ. God can kill, still use you. 
It doesn't matter if you have neglected God for a long period of time and you end up in this situation. But when you're in that situation, when you get to know Jesus, your life will never be the same. Carla Faye Turkle became, became a Christian. She began to teach other people on death row about Jesus. So many came to know Jesus through Carla Faye Tucker and met Jesus as their savior that these women re recalled and renamed uh, this death row as life row because they got to know Jesus on death row. They named it life row. Because they they became they became in con they came in contact with the true life in Jesus Christ. Eventually, Carla Faye Tucker was executed. She was executed for her crime, but her testimony affected a nation. The testimony affected the entire world. She was given lethal injection after 14 years on death row. She died, but before she died, she became a Christian. And once she became a Christian, God began to work around her. She joined God where God was at work. And many souls came to know Jesus because of the life of this murderer. God is able to change your life today. God is able to make a difference in your life. God is able to transform us so we can join him in transforming others. The door of the church is open. We need to know that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And over 2,000 years ago, he died on Calvary for you and for me. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a hill called Calvary. Mean men killed him between two thieves. On a skull hill called Calvary, men killed him. A innocent man died between two guilty men. Jesus of Christ died for you and for me. God was at work. Jesus was dying. And even while he died, was dying, he stopped long enough to save a guilty man. One man gave his life as he was dying. He was guilty. He was dying. Jesus was dying. A third man was dying on a skill called on a hill called Calvary. And when Jesus was dying, when Jesus was in this situation of death, he was able to save so many. And because he died on Calvary, they took him off the cross, laid him in a barred tomb. And when he died and was laid in a barred tomb, the devil was convinced that he was done. But early that third day morning, God raised Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, raised Jesus from the dead. And when he raised Jesus from the dead, he made it possible for you to get to know him even in 2024. If you're listening to me tonight, God is at work all around you. There is, there is a reason why you're listening. And that reason is because God is at work all around you. And as he's at work, he's asking those of us who love him, those of us who are saved to involve ourselves with you, that you will be saved also. So I say to you today, you can receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior right here, right now. The door is open because after Jesus died, he rose early that third day morning. He rose for you and for me that you will have a, have a right to the tree of life. If that is you and you never received Jesus as your personal savior, would you bow your head with me right now? Invite Jesus into your life that you can be a new person. Carla Faye Tucker, 
was a criminal. Carla Faye Tucker killed a man and a woman in Houston, Texas, in their own apartment with a pickaxe. Killed them. No apparent reason. She chose knowingly, willingly, and recklessly killed them. She did an awful deed. And for that, she got death row. But while she was on death row, God was at work around her and she became active for God. She became actively involved in God. Regardless of what you've done, regardless of where you come, regardless of where you're headed, I say to you, you must be born again in order to get to heaven. Will you join me right now? Bow your head in prayer and invite Jesus Christ into your life. Just repeat this simple prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, trusting that Jesus is the son of God, that he died for your sins and rose from the dead. We believe now that you are born again. Go ahead and look where God is at work. Join God where he's at work. He's at work in our local churches. I say to you, we welcome you to the New Beginning Church. Come and join us at the New Beginning Church where God is at work and where you can put forth good works for the Lord. We're located at 4251 Shiremai Road in Houston, Texas, 77048. That's 4251 Shiremai Road. Shiremai is spelled S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. Shiremai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048, USA. We'll be glad to hear from you. Be glad to see you. Thank you for joining us here tonight at our Bible study. Our Bible study is every Wednesday night at 7.15 p.m. Central Time. We meet in Sunday school on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. Come and join us for 9 a.m. Sunday school. And please come and join us for 10.30 worship service. We'll be glad to have you. And if you're looking for a church home, we welcome you to be a local member or a global member of the New Beginning Church. It's often time, if you want to give financially to our ministry, you can do so <clears throat> by giving to Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. That is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can mail it in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Again, thank you for joining us. Please look, please look forward to joining us every Wednesday night at 7.15 uh, p.m. Central Time. We look forward to hearing from you. We look forward to seeing you. If you have reached out to Jesus tonight and you've joined us in this Christian walk, we'd like to know about it. Inbox us and let us know so we can rejoice with you that you've come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Be blessed.